I'm going to talk uh, not only about the software that we've built, uh, but also about the philosophy uh, underlying that software, because I think it's a, it's a relatively novel approach to how to collect, uh, manage, and analyze data. And it's one that is becoming increasingly more common uh, in the healthcare and medical space, uh, but <clears throat> really uh, it was innovated upon in the web domain and is slowly making its way out of the web world into the rest of uh, the world. So uh, when I think about what people are doing when they're doing data analysis, there's really two parts to the problem. Uh, the first part of the problem is assembling a data set which has the relevant and accurate information that you need to do. And of course, in the healthcare space, that can often be very difficult because of uh, the variety of data formats used, uh, the privacy uh, constraints which are applied uh, to who can see which data. Um, but this is, uh, this is a very important piece. And then once you've got your data set assembled and prepared, you need to choose the appropriate analysis technique. So our software kind of splits evenly into software which helps you assemble the, uh, the data set and then software which helps you analyze the data set. So the first half of the philosophy, how to assemble the data set, we really believe that you should put all your data in one place. And as I mentioned before, I know that's very difficult in this domain because of privacy restrictions, uh, but there's just uh, a lot of network benefits. In the same way that there were network benefits to the product of Facebook by putting all, all these users into one uh, social network, there's uh, the, the same kind of network effects which occur when you put disparate data sets into the same data store. Okay, so once you have all your data in one place, uh, there, even, even if your organization ascribes to that philosophy, uh, a lot of times what I see are uh, intense exercises undergone before any data is collected, uh, where the organi organization needs to decide what questions are we going to ask of this data? Why are we collecting this data in the first place? And this seems like a good practice, right? It seems like a good idea to know what you're going to ask of your data uh, before you collect it. But from my perspective, that's absolutely the wrong thing to do. Uh, that data is just getting dropped on the floor and it will never be useful to you uh, while you're deciding what to do with it. So if you choose to, uh, if you have data that you can generate and you can store, it's so cheap to store that data, you should just start storing it today because there's going to be something that you can do with this data. Uh, and, and more importantly, not only should you start storing it as soon as you can, you shouldn't even worry about what it looks like. I see, uh, and in fact, I think there's a panel today about uh, you know, health uh, standards for data formats. And I see people all the time deciding not to store data or requiring onerous uh, code on the data generators and the, and the folks instrumenting and collecting data uh, to, to make it co uh, conform to this rigorous standard. Uh, but in reality, that kind, of, uh, that kind of formatting of data is best done in a post-processing fashion. Uh, because once again, if you're not collecting it, uh, you can't do anything with it. Uh, digitizing reality is the only way that we can learn about what was happening then. And, and if you choose to, uh, to limit what can be digitized, or either in a temporal fashion or in terms of um, what kind of structure it must have, then you're limiting the kinds of uh, questions that you can answer. So we really believe strongly that put all your data in one place, don't worry about what questions you're going to ask of it, don't worry about what structure it has, just start storing it. And then you can worry about uh, figuring out what questions you're going to ask, figuring out what structure that data should have in a post-processing fashion. And some of the, the trends which are supporting this, uh, this philosophy, I think the biggest is the, the rapidly diminishing cost of raw storage. So four cents a gigabyte is actually a, a high number. I just, I just did a, a Google product search for hard drives, for one terabyte hard drives, and you know, you can get, well, two terabyte hard drives for 80 bucks is, uh, is a pretty high price. If you really try, you can probably get it down to 65, 67 dollars for a two terabyte hard drive. So this number is actually closer to three and a half, or even under three and a half cents a gigabyte. Uh, and when you think about the total cost uh, of an employee, for example, compared, you can, for a fully loaded employee, you can have about two to three petabytes of raw data sitting around. Uh, and so when you think about the amount of uh, data sitting within most hospitals, uh, it's probably less than even that number, two to three petabytes. So for the cost of a single full-time employee, you could, you could double the, the, the storage capabilities uh, of, of a hospital. Now this number looks totally different if you go and buy your storage from uh, a traditional storage vendor like an EMC. And that number goes about two orders of magnitude up. Uh, and so that's why organizations have this notion that storage costs a lot. But in reality, the raw hardware is very cheap. It's just because there isn't a, uh, a solid open source platform for storing that data that was making storage so expensive. Um, but now there is. So there's uh, the Hadoop distributed file system, which is one of the pieces of software that we make, uh, can handle single namespaces. So uh, a single file system, like on your laptop, uh, which might scale to a, a few gigabytes, uh, we can actually scale that up to, to greater than 50 petabytes and even beyond. So you can have a, a single file system all underneath the slash that you can navigate, uh, which has you know, hundreds of petabytes of data. So you can, there's nothing limiting you from putting it all in one pace, 
uh, any longer on the namespace side. And obviously the trends driving both of these, uh, the lower cost and the scalability are uh, the fact that the software runs on commodity hardware. So you can buy you know, off the shelf pizza box servers from your favorite uh, white box vendor and then you install open source software on it, uh, which creates a radically different cost structure. And more importantly, it's horizontally scalable. So when you need new storage, you can just order another part rather than having to radically re-architect how your storage system works. So traditional SANs that you might be familiar with or, or network filers uh, often come in restricted configurations and can only scale so far. So when you want to scale them beyond that, you have a, a breaking change rather than uh, an incremental change. And more importantly, I think, is uh, our software is designed as a set of modular uh, composable software components as opposed to some of these relational databases that you may have used, which are very opaque abstractions. They stuff everything from storage uh, to query processing to query uh, interface into the same package. So that's all about how to, to prepare a, uh, an accurate and cleansed data set. Uh, that's the philosophy there. In terms of doing the analysis, we think it's very important to, uh, as Jim Gray said, let everyone party on the data. Uh, you know, there's, there's the value that can be unlocked from your data is dependent upon uh, the context of the user performing the analysis. And so developers are going to be able to unlock different kinds of value from your data uh, than analysts and than business users. And if you don't give each one of them tools which enable them to consume data in a way in which they're comfortable with, then you're not, getting, you're not deriving the true value from the data that your, uh, your users are generating. So there's a lot of capabilities uh, required of a software solution to enable this wide variety of people to be able to analyze the data. Uh, so you need to be able to isolate each one of them from one another so that you know, a business user over here doesn't uh, take resources away from a developer who's building an application over here. You need to be able to do workload management to then divide up resources between those containers, um, which, are, um, uh, which are preventing those, uh, your users from stepping on one another's toes. Uh, you need multiple different execution frameworks. So there's different ways to process data. Uh, MapReduce is one that you may have heard of, and it's very popular uh, as, uh, as implemented in, in Hadoop. Uh, but there's a variety of ways to process data in parallel. And uh, we need to be able to accommodate all of these. And we need different interfaces. So a developer might be comfortable writing code in Java, um, but a business user might prefer a, a point and click user interface. So you need to be able to accommodate all the different user interfaces. And hopefully this kind of system should improve over time. We expect all the software we use on the web today to remember what we've done and decide to show us better uh, items based on what we've done in the past. And we've yet to kind of uh, encode that same expectation in our system software. Uh, but I think we should have the same, ex uh, the same experience when we use system software as we do when we use web software. So just to give you a, a picture of kind of how this looks, so if any of you are familiar with traditional data warehousing and business intelligence, this is kind of the approach used for analytical data management today. This is, this is kind of the canonical approach uh, where you have an application database serving whatever it is, your mobile app, your web app, your internet app, and at some point you decide you want to do analytics over that data. So you create an offline repository called your data warehouse, and then you set up a process called the extract, transform, and load process, ETL, to migrate data from your application database into your data warehouse. And then you can use tools uh, to, to create charts and graphs, uh, which kind of falls under the heading of business intelligence, or you can actually do uh, in-depth statistical analyses of the data in your data warehouse, which kind of goes by the name of analytics. So this is, uh, uh, you know, large vendors in this world are, are the oracles and the uh, teradatas. Uh, in data warehousing, there's Informatica and ETL. Uh, business intelligence has business objects, Cognos, you may have heard of. Analytics, SaaS is probably the biggest vendor there. Uh, so this is, uh, this is tried and true. It's worked for you know, two to three decades, but it's kind of stopped working in the last decade or so. So this is, this is the new model that we're, we're trying to advocate. So as you, as you start thinking about building out your analy analytics infrastructure and you think you might have you know, greater than a terabyte of data to play with, you might think about this as a, as a uh, potential architecture as opposed to a more traditional data warehousing model. So the system that we've built called Hadoop, you can place in between your application database and your data warehouse and use it to absorb data from the application database, but also, as you can see up top, you can load different types of data, like documents, images, log files, uh, and other multimedia or unstructured data into the system, and we're able to, to store and analyze it effectively. Uh, and while you can run your business intelligence and analytics tools off of your data warehouse, you can also run a lot of them off of the Hadoop and Hive installation as well. Uh, so this creates, uh, this enables you to, to store more data uh, at higher volume, to store more kinds of data, so more complex data formats, and it allows you to do more flexible types of analyses over your data. So to, to, to give a, a name to some of those software components, to kind of break apart that cloud that was in the middle of that diagram, 
and, and start talking about how we build it, we, we think of it as kind of three key components. Uh, the substrate, the storage, and the compute. Uh, so in the same way that uh, with your computer, uh, you know, the substrate is, is essentially you know, the, uh, the tower that you've bought. Uh, the storage substrate is the file system and the compute substrate is the process scheduler which allows different processes to run on your computer. Uh, we have the same notion except we're running on a warehouse full of computers as opposed to just one computer under your desk. Uh, so at the bottom of, of what we do, we need hardware resources which can store uh, and compute over bits. Um, so commodity servers are very important to us. We, we run on top of a warehouse full of these, tens of thousands of them. Uh, and one interesting project in this space that you may have heard of is uh, Facebook's Open Compute Project. So they've gone beyond open source software, and they've actually made their data center and server designs uh, available as open source as well. So they've collaborated with folks like Rackspace uh, and a lot of other vendors uh, to actually describe how they build their servers in a public forum. Uh, and hopefully over the next few years, this will pay off and lower uh, server costs for all of us. Uh, obviously, there's an open source operating system called Linux, which is very robust. Uh, and well-developed, which you can then install on top of these servers and enable you as a programmer to access those hardware resources. Uh, one piece which is gaining in, uh, in momentum is the configuration management piece. So once you've got your operating system installed on these commodity servers, you need some way to tell those servers to all bring themselves into the same state. And the configuration management enables you to ensure that dependencies are installed, configuration parameters are set accordingly, and the servers are in a uniform state waiting for your software. And then there's a software that we build at Cloudera called Zookeeper, uh, which enables multiple servers within a data center to communicate in a coherent fashion. So if there's some shared state, uh, such as how we should all be configured, that needs to be updated coherently so that everyone sees the same view of it, uh, Zookeeper allows you to do that. So given this substrate, you can now take all of this, this, uh, these hardware resources and turn them into a way to store uh, petabytes of data, as we said. So there's kind of three aspects to storage for us. There's uh, schemaless data, and so this is the, uh, an important uh, aspect of how we're able to store log files, images, documents, et cetera, unstructured data. So we have a, a distributed schemaless storage at the base of our system, and that's Hadoop Distributed File System, as I described. But given that base of file storage, we've built on top of it two types of uh, tabular storage. So if your data looks more like a record uh, than a file, and then we have two options for you. One is an append-only table storage. So for a lot of analytical use cases, you don't really want to forget anything that happened in the past. And you don't really want to go back and modify it because I don't know about you guys, I've had a very hard time modifying what has happened in the past in my life. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the ability to, to essentially just record everything that has happened and then do analytics over it. So append-only table storage and the metadata associated with it tends to fall under a name of a project called Hive. And if you have mutable state, so the kinds of state which drives applications, uh, which needs to be created, updated, deleted, modified, uh, then HBase is a nice solution for that. And each of these uh, solutions can scale to, as I mentioned, many petabytes in size. So that's the storage substrate. Once you've got all of your data in one place and you've stored it effectively, you need a, you need a way to compute over it. So recently, uh, in, in Hadoop, we've separated the MapReduce parallel processing framework from a general purpose cluster resource manager called Yarn. Uh, so Yarn is a way to uh, divide up this warehouse full of compute resources uh, to a, a variety of applications which would like uh, to use those compute resources for parallel processing. Uh, so on top of Yarn, you can implement a variety of parallel processing frameworks. MapReduce is the most commonly used and probably the most robust given its uh, maturity from use in a variety of organizations such as Yahoo and Facebook. Um, but there are uh, novel processing frameworks and existing pro parallel processing frameworks which are being ported to run on top of Yarn. Uh, one, a great example of that is MPI. So MPI is a standard for uh, communications intensive parallel processing which is very common in the high performance computing space. And some of you may have used it already uh, to do things like simulations or Monte Carlo uh, sampling. And so you can take uh, an MPI framework, get it to run on top of Yarn, and you can use the same cluster to run MapReduce and MPI jobs. And there's a variety of novel uh, parallel processing frameworks which are emerging from the community which will, which will uh, encourage even more innovation. And so once you've got a cluster resource manager and then a variety of parallel processing frameworks that can do work uh, with your cluster resources, you need a high level interface that allows you to actually program uh, those parallel processing frameworks. So MapReduce itself is an API for programmers to access, but some higher level interfaces include Flume Java, uh, which is an interface uh, created at Google uh, implemented by our, our team at Cloudera and something called Crunch. Uh, and this is a, a higher level framework for, uh, for writing um, MapReduce jobs in Java. 
there's also novel language, languages which have been created, such as Pig Latin, which came out of Yahoo Research, uh, HiveQL, which is an implementation of SQL, and an even higher level is an XML uh, configuration language for workflows called Uzi. And you can put a UI on top of things like HiveQL and Uzi to expose it to your business users. Uh, once you have the, uh, the substrate, the storage, and the compute uh, running on your cluster, you need a way to actually integrate this with the rest of your data center. So we implement a variety of protocols which are standard. Uh, so things like JDBC and ODBC for access to tabular structured data, things like Fuse for access to file data, uh, and then to actually move data into these uh, systems from relational databases, we have a project called Scoop. From log files, we have a project called Flume. And these help you actually populate this data. So, as I mentioned, a lot of the software comes out of the web domain. Uh, but over the last, you know, Clutter is now about three and a half years old. And we've, we've acquired customers in essentially every vertical. And I want to highlight for you guys a few use cases that we've seen inside of the med uh, medical and healthcare vertical. Uh, so one that we've done ourselves is we actually took an open data set uh, that the FDA makes available about adverse drug events. Uh, so there's this thing called the Adverse Event Reporting System, uh, which whenever, if something goes wrong, when you, take, uh, when you take some drugs, you can tell the FDA, the FDA logs that data and makes it available to everyone. Uh, so working in conjunction with the FDA, we actually took that, uh, that open data, and it turns out that the, uh, the software that the FDA was using was really only uh, able to identify drug-drug interactions that might have uh, led to an adverse event. They weren't able to go to three and four drug interactions because of the data explosion that happens. Uh, as you can imagine, you're exploring uh, sort of exponentially more uh, possible combinations with each one. And so, so identifying novel uh, three and four drug combinations which lead to adverse events uh, is very important, and it's something that the FDA wasn't capable uh, of doing on their own. So our team worked with the FDA. We used, as I mentioned, the, the Pig Latin language to, to write some code. Um, to manipulate the data to identify uh, what, what looked to us to be novel three and four drug uh, combinations which led to uh, a statistically significant incidence of um, adverse drug events. And the important thing is, uh, that's key to our philosophy, is that we didn't actually have to write any complex algorithms. Uh, we, were, we were able to just use simple data management, data processing techniques at a much larger scale to identify uh, these novel combinations. So uh, you know, we made some nice visualizations for them. So this is actually we were able to uh, we were able to take the drugs, um, uh, look for the ones that got taken together, and we were able to identify certain clusters of drugs which were often taken together and, and led to adverse events. So you could see things like you know we, we turned up oh these are the drugs most commonly used to treat HIV, and we didn't know that in advance. These were just clusters that we found in the data via our, our analysis. Uh, another, another application that was actually done down in uh, UCLA and built on top of the mutable da uh, table data store I mentioned called HBase um, is called the, the SQLware uh, Query Engine. Uh, and so they, they, um, they want to be able to, to look at, uh, so they, they have a, a large collection of genomes and they want to be able to query uh, what are some common variants uh, across uh, the, these genomes. Uh, and they, uh, I don't know what the U87MG genome is. Um, <laughs> But they were able to, uh, to, to load in a, a number of um, uh, measurements of this genome and look at how they varied across individuals. Uh, and so this was sort of a proof of concept. And they're scaling this up uh, to do uh, a lot of really interesting things with, uh, with search and analysis of genomic data. Uh, another interesting one um, is uh, image data. So genomics data is often thought of as, uh, as a large volume of data to be analyzed in the medical space. Uh, but image data is just as high volume. And there's probably even more of it out there today. And of course, pathologists are very high, high paid people who, who uh, you know, look at images and discern what illness you might have. And it turns out that computers are really good at looking at images and discerning what might be going on there uh, as well. And so uh, at Emory University, they've built an application uh, called Rescue, which allows you to, um, uh, to allow, uh, it enhances the pathologist's ability to identify uh, significant features uh, of an image uh, using some data analysis. Uh, another company that we work with is called Explorus. Uh, so this is actually a, a customer of Cloudera. And they've taken uh, medical records data, electronic uh, healthcare records uh, from you know, tens of thousands of individuals, put them into a cluster running our software. Uh, and they're using it to, uh, to search and analyze that data for this general purpose medical informatics platform they've built, um, the variety of uh, different analyses they perform. And they've actually uh, contributed to the software themselves. So they've got an engineer on staff uh, who commits to the software. Uh, which is pretty cool. And then uh, there's another one here in the Bay Area called NextBio. 
Uh, this is very interesting uh, to me. They, uh, I've actually visited with these guys a few times. Uh, so they use some of our software to essentially comb through uh, the literature that's published on an uh, everyday basis, which is you know, uh, too much for any one individual or even a lab to be able to ingest and annotate and understand. Uh, and then, so they use our software to, to pull in that literature and generate uh, all kinds of structured data that can be queried uh, and also to integrate that literature with existing um, data sets uh, to show, you know, okay, when, if there's a novel treatment for this disease or if there's some protein that you've been analyzing and someone published research about it, it's going to immediately highlight that for you. And uh, the interesting piece about uh, NextBio is they also allow you to integrate their uh, data set that they've collected from all the publicly available data with your private data set. So they work with private, uh, they work with pharma companies who might have generated a tremendous amount of information about drug targets uh, that they know a lot about that they don't want to tell everyone else about, but they allow themselves to, they allow those companies to cross-reference that data uh, with the data that's publicly available uh, via their literature search. And a company called First Life Research is doing uh, similar things. Uh, you guys may have heard of IBM Watson, uh, so Hadoop is uh, one of the key technologies which powers their, uh, their ability to analyze uh, same sorts of things, so they, they, they pull a lot of structured data out of the literature, um, and they had a nice, they spent a lot of money on marketing it, so I pulled their picture from, uh, from the TV commercial that you may have seen. So they talk a lot now about how they're, they're trying to point uh, the Watson technology at doing automated diagnosis, and a lot of this is running our software underneath the surface. Uh, Microsoft Research has done some really interesting things. Uh, so they actually, they looked at the search logs of Bing.com and they, they, they coined this term called cyberchondria. So they were actually looking at the path that internet searchers who are searching for symptoms online take and they were trying to identify whether they were ac being accurately diagnosed uh, simply via online web searches or, you know, what they actually showed is that a lot of people were, were self-diagnosing with, uh, with illnesses which were far more severe than they actually had. Uh, and so they coined this term cyberchondria. In any case, I hope those examples have given you um, a good idea of how our technology can be used across a variety of applications, from adverse drug events uh, to, uh, to genomics data, uh, to image processing, to literature search, to electronic healthcare records, uh, to automated diagnosis. And so there's really a wide variety of ways that one can use data to improve health outcomes. And I hope some of the folks in this room are able to, to put our software to good use soon.